Hello and welcome to this special poultry cast presentation featuring Dr. Todd Applegate of Purdue University speaking on amino acid digestibility, methodology, and application. Really this uh, presentation is kind of a Cliff Notes version of uh, what began essentially four years ago is discussion with both the broiler and turkey industries as well as the amino acid companies um, towards moving the industry forward towards adopting the digestible amino acid formulation method, if you will. With that, uh, we obviously see challenges today and it's becoming more and more important, at least for producers, as they especially bring in uh, byproduct ingredients to uh, account for those amino acids which aren't utilized by, by the bird itself. Now, when we met four years ago, uh, back in 2004, with uh, formulating nutritionists from across those, uh, the meat bird segment, uh, we identified a couple of different things. One really is the limitations uh, that they would see from a research methodology for adopting uh, the digestible amino acid formulation concept. And secondarily, we also discussed uh, uh, application limitations from the industry perspective as well that were well beyond um, what we can handle from the, the academia side, a lot of those being logistical issues. Um, this list is uh, not exclusive by any stretch or, and it's not prioritized at all, but suffice to say uh, these were the things that were identified back in 2004 and we've tried to chew on those at least from the research perspective over the years. Uh, these include uh, understanding better of how the bird utilizes amino acids, especially at those young ages, looking at environmental types of things, on the influence on especially endogenous amino acid loss, uh, further refinement and development of uh, the rapid assays for determination of digestible amino acids, standardization of the methodology for determination of that endogenous correction for endogenous amino acid flow, and that in combination with development of a consensus bioassay. Further looking at how different uh, processing methods affect uh, the utilization of amino acids, particularly from byproducts. And the one uh, byproduct that especially was highlighted was that of meat and bone meal, uh, understanding how fat quality uh, and uh, the new, at that time, uh, meat and bone meals, especially on the beef side, without that at-risk material, uh, how time of death of the carcass before that uh, carcass is rendered into meat and bone meal affects uh, amino acid uh, availability, uh, how the influence of collagen with uh, hydroxyproline influences those as well, and essentially then putting forward, instead of having databases across different laboratories and uh, different companies, essentially a centralized database encompassing uh, different ingredient digestibility values uh, across the board so that folks would be more willing to adopt this technology. So far, we've, we've addressed a few of these issues, particularly from trying to develop a consensus bioassay. We've also looked at the age of the bird, how the age of the bird influences amino acid utilization from a number of different ingredients, and tried to then work on standardization methods for uh, uh, endogenous corrections. From the industry perspective, really the question still remains um, from both the vendor and the the, uh, the live production aspects, how do we account for ingredient-to-ingredient -ingredient variability, particularly when we're talking about these byproducts? And as, uh, as buyers, can we leverage some aspects to make sure that we are more consistent in uh, the nutrient profiles and availability from those ingredients? However, we obviously have some application limitations because with the bioassays and even with the current in vitro technologies, uh, we really are limited on, on being able to formulate diets on a real-time basis. Um, and how, to, how do we accomplish that with uh, just uh, working with suppliers and getting a handle on single-source ingredients from a particular supplier? Um, when we look at variability in ingredient analyses, uh, particularly our limited 
uh, again, by the byproducts because of their increased variability. And from the academic perspective, we really do not have a good handle on digestible amino acid requirements across production phases. Now, I think some recent uh, researchers, as we talk more about the digestible amino acid concept, actually within some of their papers uh, within the last year or two, um, are doing a really good job of publishing digestible values of those diets in tandem with uh, uh, when they do these uh, requirement studies. So if we look at some of the limitations of the industry, one of those really is our ability to understand and get a particular nutrient to the bird and understanding how that nutrient is going to actually be, be utilized by the bird itself. Kind of an academic exercise, we went back into poultry science, pulled articles from 1985 to 2002 across our primary poultry species, um, and what we looked at was uh, uh, nitrogen retention values across those studies. So the values that you see in this table are actually control diets from birds fed corn soybean meal diets and these were the the uh, mean values presented from those control diets in these particular study so what stands out particularly if we look at the studies with the meat birds uh, keep in mind these are the averages across that particular study here we have 11 reports on the case of the broiler but these range those averages range from 44% to 73.5%. Now these are averages across control diets and that points out to us at least that there is considerable variability uh, just even in controlled environments on how much that bird is able to actually use. That's not in the, the field situations where we do have different environmental stressors that do occur. So that's partly why we are, in, it's imperative to include some safety margin within reason. If we try and sum all those processes then of what that bird is actually going to get as far as the nutrient and actually utilize, we kind of get to the, the realization of, of how much nutrient we do need to include. We have variation from sampling, uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, variation in knowing what nutrients we actually have within ingredients or within our final mixed diets. Uh, across labs, 10 to 20 percent CV. Within labs, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, depending upon nutrients. We have mixer variation. Hopefully, we're uh, between 5 and 10 percent. We see variation in bird utilization. At least the example I gave before on the broiler. That's roughly what we see on nitrogen retention values. And we see ingredient to ingredient variation in its content. Now, if we do the sum of squares of all these variation, our overall process uncertainty should be somewhere between 19 to 32 percent. That doesn't give us very much confidence in where we are, at least in, as far as knowing what that bird is actually going to get. And most of our safety margins, because of just economies today, have to be much lower than that. Another way to look at this is uh, work uh, from one of the USDA regional projects, this reported by Gary Cromwell back in 2003. And what they did, a, a group of swine researchers from across the country, uh, 25 different labs, tried to just look at how much inherent variability there is in trying to target a nutrient formulation um, and then actually analyze for that nutrient. So what they did was they had 25 labs that had the same diet formulation values for fairly simple corn soybean meal diets, formulated them, formulated them, mixed them, and then uh, tried to analyze for these particular nutrients. Now the variation that they saw in formulation and mixing, at least for crude protein, roughly was about 4%. Being able to actually analyze for crude protein had fairly similar analytical error uh, across labs at about 3.6%. As we go to the different nutrients being some of the macro and micro minerals, we see that uh, that variation essentially jumping up quite a bit. Calcium being 9.3, analytical error for calcium being 12.5%. So in the case of uh, this talk, at least on curd protein, at least we're doing fairly good of formulating and mixing across, in this case, fairly simple diets. 
um, and are being able to analyze, but realize that the formulating and mixing error is about as accurate as what you can analyze for. So when we're actually looking at trying to formulate those diets on a digestible amino acid basis, in the past, there's a number of different methods to do this. Typically, it's done either by a growth assay or through digestibility assays. Uh, in the past, we did not have a good understanding of the influence of hindgut microflora, and in some cases, in older literature, it will tend to see excreta values being utilized. Uh, however, today, it's either using utilization of the uh, pre precision-fed cachectomized rooster or collection of ileal digesta for determination of how much disappearance of an amino acid there, there is. Now, in order to account for, for the endogenous amino acid flow, and I'll talk about where the sources actually come from here in a minute, uh, there are a number of different methods that, that people actually use to determine this. It's either through feeding of a protein-free diet, feeding of a highly digestible protein source, uh, feeding of different levels of a highly digestible protein source and then regressing it back through zero, uh, essentially to a zero, uh, zero uh, percent protein or essentially that nitrogen-free diet. Um, and there's a reason for that, and I'll cover here in a second. Um, or looking at uh, a fasted cachectomized rooster on how much endogenous amino acids is actually coming out. So these are fairly... Uh, straightforward, some of the, the uh, quicker and uh, I'll say cheaper of the, the bioassay methodologies to look at endogenous amino acid flow, um, and that's basal endogenous amino acid flow. Now, to actually look at what I would call and get to a true standardization, uh, we would have to go through either isotope dilution techniques, uh, using the homoarginine guanidation technique, or peptide alimentation ultrafiltration methods, uh, which are much more laborious and much more expensive uh, to conduct on a on a routine basis. So, where do these endogenous amino acids actually come from? Realistically, this is a number of different sources within the gastrointestinal tract, and they come from either saliva, gastric secretions, bile, microbial losses, sloughed epithelial cells through gut turnover, mucin and mucus, and pancreatic secretions. Now, make sure we're on the same page in looking at um, what portion we're actually correcting for on this endogenous amino acid loss. In most cases, we're talking about this nonspecific basal endogenous amino acid loss uh, when we're talking about feeding of either a uh, nitrogen-free diet or looking at a fasted uh, cachectomized rooster. We are not taking into account things that uh, increase the ingredient-specific endogenous amino acid flow, uh, as you see in the white area here. This specifically uh, can be attributed to factors such as fiber, where we know we get increased uh, turnover rates, increased uh, uh, secretion of some uh, digestive enzymes and whatnot into the digestive tract. To put that more simply, um, it's, it's probably more correct to say when we're only accounting for the C region, that basal endogenous amino acid flow, uh, again, indicated through the, the feeding of a nitrogen-free diet or collection of excreta from a, a, a fasted cachectomized rooster, we're only accounting for this, uh, this uh, basal endogenous loss. Therefore, we term this as a standardized digestibility. If we were able to account for this ingredient-specific amino acid loss, again, this being somewhat more of a laborious experimental bioassay, uh, if we're able to account for both B and C, that re really would then be termed, termed the true digestibility. Shift gears and talk a little bit about what we actually see within that endogenous amino acid flow then across ages. And it's very interesting when we look across both the, the turkey pole and the chick uh, between five during the first three weeks of age, we see that in the case of the turkey pole, uh, 
uh, between 5 and 15 days of age, we see a reduction by about 47% in endogenous amino acid flow. About 32%, excuse me. In the chick, we see that being reduced by about 47%. This becomes then very critical as we think about age-appropriate um, endogenous flow corrections for our amino acid digestibility values. And this be will become apparent here in a minute as we look across some particular studies and across ingredients. Now, one of the other methodologies that we have included as well is that regression technique where we fed different levels of dietary casein, whether it be 5, 10, or 15 percent uh, casein. So the endogenous amino acid flow that we do receive values from these percentages, we are able to regress then back through zero um, and essentially then look at that basal endogenous amino acid loss uh, when no uh, amino acids were actually fed. When we do that in practice uh, at 21 days, the slide is actually five days, um, at 21 days of age, that regression uh, is not distinguishable, at least from a nitrogen-free diet. Therefore, because of some of the differences that we've seen across at least this regression technique and feeding of different levels of of a highly digestible protein source such as casein, we've decided to, for future studies at least, to use the nitrogen-free methodology for determination of this endogenous amino acid loss. And when we focus then at least uh, on standardization, it it's, it's, uh, really becomes apparent on why we need to include an age-appropriate standardization. If we look at essentially compare across uh, studies in the literature, uh, the second study here by uh, uh, conducted by Amy Batal down at the University of Georgia, um, she was looking at the effects of age of utilization of soybean meal between a 7 and 21 day old broiler using the ileal method uh, versus a cachectomized rooster. Uh, for the endogenous corrections that she used for these studies, she did a a comparison then back to a previous literature from Andreas Lem um, and from essentially a uh, three-plus-week-old uh, broiler. And what becomes interesting as you look at this, uh, threening in particular, you do see some differences attributable to age um, with a one particular endogenous correction, uh, again, for that older bird. However, as we look uh, and account for that difference in endogenous loss that we see due to age, that essentially negates the difference in uh, utilization then across these ages. So essentially we can, can say that at least in the case of soybean meal here, it appears that there is essentially one value that we can plug into our uh, digestibility coefficients across ages, at least for this particular soybean meal value. It also becomes interesting in looking at uh, the cachectomized rooster assay that she saw from a separate soybean meal sample to what we saw in this particular study, almost identical in the case of uh, threonine for utilization. And in, case, in the cases of the other ingredients, at least, um, not really that different from what she saw on a cachectomized rooster. I'll show you some other examples here in a minute of comparisons across uh, methodologies that we've done as well. Uh, for a number of different ingredients as well. Uh, this age-appropriate standardization really, really is very interesting. In the past, when we've we've thought of the bird's ability to utilize nutrients more efficiently with age, uh, usually that thought has come from essentially an apparent value. We see that due to age going from 5 to 21 days of age, here in the case of the turkey poult being fed DDGS, a DDGS source, we see a dramatic increase in its ability to uh, utilize that uh, that lysine. However, when we apply that or account for that endogenous amino acid flow, here in the case of this particular DDGS source, really we do not then see any differences in uh, digestibility due to accounting for that endogenous amino acid loss. 
If we look across, again, those ages across a range of ingredients, here being a light DDG sample, a dark DDG sample, canola meal, corn, or soybean meal, three out of the five, at least, are different due to age. We see that the both DDGS sources, in the case of the chick, here looking at three standardized three and digestibilities using, again, the nitrogen-free diet, we do see an increase in digestibility uh, with both DDGS sources. Um, corn, we see a slight increase as well from approximately 70% upwards of uh, 83 to 85%. However, in the case of canola meal and the case of soybean meal uh, for threonine digestibility, we really do not see any differences attributable to age across these studies. If we look at the other primary byproduct that's being used out there on the industry, that of meat and bone meal sources, um, we do see in, across a range of uh, meat and bone meals that we ran in this particular study, whether it be a beef source, an all-pork source, a, two blends, one being somewhat better, uh, one somewhat being higher ash with more trim in it, uh, we see at least all these meat and bone sources being different from day 5 to day 21. For some reason, this beef source uh, dropped from 5 to 21 days of age on a standardized amino acid digestibility. However, the other three sources essentially increased quite dramatically from, from 5 to 21 days of age. As far as our comfort level with the ILEO methodology, uh, if we look across laboratories, essentially what we did uh, was we we mixed our our diets here at Purdue, um, then conducted a couple of different studies here, one on broiler chicks and then one on turkey poults. We then shipped the same diet batch to uh, Carl Parsons at the University of Illinois and also to Mike Loburn at Ohio State University, and they conducted essentially in tandem studies to determine the endogenous amino acid flow. And what we saw across those studies in, in calculating then the endogenous amino acid flow, uh, I should note that all these, these uh, samples then were collected, freeze-dried, and shipped to uh, University of Missouri. So we've accounted for mixing error and accounted for analytical variability to some degree by using the same laboratory. So if we're just looking at the site of where these studies are conducted and error between them, uh, when we look at endogenous amino acid flow across uh, different research labs, we really do not see any differences in endogenous amino acid flow. When we look here in these slides from methionine to threonine to total amino acid flow, whether that be in five-day-old chicks or in 21-day-old broilers, I don't have the slide included with this, but uh, essentially the same held fairly true for the turkey pulled as well, that, that uh, these, res these results for endogenous amino acid flow were repeatable across laboratories as well. One of the things we've been trying to do, you know, is increase the numbers of samples that we've been looking at uh, uh, and the range within each of these ingredients to essentially then be able to compare the ILEO methodology that we've been developing uh, as well as others throughout the world, I should say, um, comparing those values versus what traditionally had been done in a sacectomized rooster with a, a uh, fasted endogenous loss correction. So the table you see in front of you here has not been published uh, as of yet, but um, here you'll see the primary standardized ileal amino acid digestibility, that standardization occurring from a nitrogen-free diet to determine endogenous amino acid loss. The numbers of samples that we have over here uh, just included at least lysine, methionine, and threonine for, for the ingredients that we have here, is the ingredients being corn, soybean meal, uh, DDGS sources, meat and bone meal, poultry byproduct meal, and canola meal. Now what becomes interesting, at least, is uh, looking particularly, say, at our primary ingredients being corn and soy, uh, not a lot of variability, at least in the case of corn, coming across these seven samples. Um, the DDGS sources that we have used in the past, uh, we've, we've been uh, very fortunate to have some, some ethanol plants work with us as far as inclusion of different soluble, 
solubles addition rates and recycling rates of fines back through the dryers so we can get a range of, of uh, digestibilities. Um, Dave Kirstein has done a wonderful job in, in the Fats and Proteins Research Foundation in helping us source different meat and bone meals from, from across the source, across the country, and across numerous different sources. Uh, the, John Les at ADM worked with us to identify bean meal samples from across the uh, across the country and actually across growing seasons as well. The corn samples uh, are a number of different hybrids, at least from Indiana and across different growing seasons as well. So essentially, if we look at those. Uh, we see, especially with the meat and bone meals, quite a range, at least, on, on variability across those sources. But that was partly by design as to what sources we were, we were identifying. If we look then at the, the samples that we have the most numbers for now, um, we should be adding to that soon with our bean meal samples. Um, but our, we have a range, at least in corn, for lysine, anywhere from a 71% to an 86% digestibility. Our meat meals range from 47 to 82% on the lysine digestibility, and our DDGs from a 52% to a 75%. Now, on average, I'd say on that DDGS sources, most are coming anywhere from uh, 68 to 72%. And it was interesting at the multi-state me meeting uh, when Phil Smith of uh, Tyson presented some results, at least in the case of what they see on their variability on DDGS samples, uh, our average of 60, 68% digestibility, um, and what we see with more modern plants, you know, being a little bit higher than that, upwards of 70, 72%, I would say, you know, is, is almost right in line with what they see with the, the idea assay or the in vitro assay that they're using. Now, one interesting exercise then that uh, we've done since then is, is go, go back then and compare then to the Ajinomoto uh, tables for standardized amino acid digestibility. Now, realize that our methodology is using a nitrogen-free diet uh, standardization for endogenous loss using the ileal collections uh, from a three-week-old broiler. Their tables are generated from a cachectomized rooster using a fasted endogenous correction. Now, with that, I think it's most telling if you look across the seven corn samples that we have and the 43 corn samples that they currently have in the database. These numbers are very, very close as far as lysine, methionine, and threonine digestibilities across these sources. Realize that with corn, I think this points out that the endogenous correction, uh, being as the amino acid levels in, in corn are very low, the correction, therefore, is, is much, much greater than most other uh, protein sources that are coming into the diet. Yet, due to the different methodologies, we have very, very similar results uh, coming in on the standardized amino acid uh, values. Now, the DDGS sources, um, we do start seeing some differences herein. Uh, part of this could be attributable to the DDGS sources that are, are uh, encompassed within the uh, Genomoto database. Um, the uh, folks at Genomoto are in, there in the process of updating this database with a number of different samples that they have run in tandem with uh, Dr. Patel from uh, University of Georgia. Um, it'll be interesting to make these comparisons then when that, that table gets updated. But nevertheless, if you look at, say, the threening digestibilities, are very, very close uh, in average between them, again, across methodologies. Um, if we look at the meat and bone meals, it's, it, for their particular database, they have a much greater database where they're able to split this into two different categories, one being a low digestible amino acid category and a high digestible amino acid category. For this particular comparison that I have here in red, we've, we've compared it against their low digestible category, which we do see that our values are tending to run somewhat lower than what they are seeing within their database. Now the question is, is this due to methodology for meat and bone meal specifically? 
or is this attributable to the different sources that are encompassed within the different databases? Now, try to, trying to address that, one of the things that we've done across uh, some of the samples, multiple samples of corn, six samples of corn, six samples of soy, six samples of DDGs, and six meat meals, uh, we're actually running these results in tandem with Dr. Parsons at uh, Illinois to compare essentially against that ileal methodology versus that of the secectomized rooster. So it'll be interesting as we, we uh, move forward within the next month or two to uh, make that comparison. We have done single sources of ingredients to look at this, uh, how this differs across methodologies, and that's what you see in this particular uh, graph here where we compared a three-week-old broiler versus that of a, uh, a um, towards the end of cycle laying hen versus that of a secectomized rooster. And at least in the single source ingredients, except for the case of the DDGs where we had a light and dark DDG sample, um, in the case of the dark DDG sample, variability within a species really precluded any differences between them. Uh, we do see slight differences in the case of the light DDG between the rooster and the laying hen, uh, the laying hen being much lower in digestibility than that of the, the uh, secectomized rooster. Uh, as far as canola meal, uh, laying hen and rooster were fairly similar, broiler being somewhat lower than the uh, the other two. Uh, in the case of corn, again, the broiler and, and rooster, as I mentioned before, on the, the comparison with the Genomoto table, at least, uh, there as well somewhat confirms we do not see many differences, at least in corn amino acid digestibilities. Bean meal, at least between a, a broiler and laying hen, no real differences on lysine digestibilities. Uh, roost, secectomized rooster being somewhat greater. Um, and in the case of the meat meal, at least we see with the laying hen, the, the ability of the laying hen to utilize lysine much, much more so from that sample than what the broiler was. But again, as we are able to do these comparisons across a number of different, uh, ingredients, uh, sources of corn, bean meal, meat meals, as well as DDGs, uh, these comparisons at least will be somewhat more telling of, of whether we can translate values from a, the ileal methodology to that of values that have been collected uh, from the secectomized rooster. I think it's almost important to really, again, emphasize the influence of environment as well uh, on nutrient utilization to kind of do illustrate that point I'm including here. This table is a summary of, of data collected by uh, Alex Corzo and Mike Kidd from Mississippi State. In this particular study, they were looking at uh, threening requirements of the bird, whether it's being reared in new litter or one on recycled litter. And regardless of what, uh, uh, what category or uh, measure that they were making, the, those birds reared on dirty litter consistently had a higher threening requirement than those birds being fed on new litter. And this really exemplifies uh, how much additional endogenous nutrient loss there is, presumably through through mucin, uh, to combat that uh, that uh, microbial load that occurs in the case of dirty litter. As far as actually applying these values, this is a very uh, recent study that uh, the folks from Avigen uh, were very kind, at least to to open the, their research facilities um, and work with us in in running a study uh, where we're we're essentially trying to put the digestible amino acid concept to to test for uh, for the broiler. And I'll say these are somewhat preliminary results and. Uh, I have to give very much credit to uh, uh, Mark DeBeer and Kim Walters at Avigen and Dave Burnham as well for uh, for working with us and, and all the legwork that they did on these studies. It's very, very commendable. Um, Dr. DeBeer should be uh, likely presenting some of this work uh, later on this year or uh, in Atlanta in January more, uh, more completely. Uh, I'll cover it just in a snapshot at least today. Um, 
essentially we conducted this study as well with uh, with Joe Hess from University of, of Auburn. The way we did this particular study, we uh, included in these diets uh, poultry meal and DDGS. Uh, Joe Joe Hess at Auburn shipped us the poultry meals and poultry meal and DDGS, where we actually then conducted the digestible digestible amino acid uh, and ME assays uh, in our shop with a three week old broiler, and then actually real time formulated. Then uh, um, Mark De Beer did um, for these particular studies with those same batch ingredients of poultry meal and DDGS. This study was conducted as a two by two by two factorial with 18 pens per gender and diet. So these these factors include male and female, the two genders. Uh, the other two main effects include amino acid formulation uh, to either 100% or 90% of uh, Avigen's uh, manual recommendations. And the final two factors being that of formulation method, whether it be on a digestible basis or on a total basis. Now, the way Mark formulated these diets, we, we uh, discussed this at length with a number of different industry uh, nutritionists as well, and the way uh, essentially came down to it, at least, uh, the, the total amino acid levels, uh, as determined by Avigen's manual recommendations, uh, were formulated by a, a very standard corn soy diet uh, to get, get the average whole diet total amino acid levels, and then the digestibilities of those ingredients uh, and those digestible amino acid levels uh, from those diets were then used to set the formulation targets for uh, digestible amino acid levels when we then included the, the poultry meal and, and DDGS into those uh, particular rations. Very, very strong statistical study, at least, because as you look at the main effect means, uh, say, for the formulation method as digestible versus total, uh, each would each of these means would represent then 72 floor pens of uh, birds with 20 birds per pen. Same would be true then for the amino acid formulation, the 100% versus 90% being again 72 floor pens uh, per per mean there. Just to give you an idea of how these diets actually uh, looked, I included the starter phase here at least on. Uh, for the main effect means, uh, crude proteins for the total versus digestible formulation on the digestible, uh, in these cases did increase crude protein. Um, we do see considerable differences as well in looking between the total lysine and digestible lysine values, uh, for the total versus digestible. That then translates into differences in diet cost, uh, here in the starter phase. Realize that, that these diets uh, were formulated between February or uh, December of 07 and February this year. Uh, so in our today's economy, these are actually being somewhat lower than what we uh, would be seeing uh, right now, at least. Uh, but suffice to say, the, the average digestible amino acid diet was somewhat more expensive than that of the total. Looking at the, the higher spec amino acid formulation as well, 24.4% starter diets uh, for the 100%, roughly about a 22% for the 90% uh, spec. Total lysine, again, being higher formulated, 146 versus 131 on a total basis, 124 versus 111 on a digestible basis. Quite a difference in cost here as well, 262 per ton on 100% versus 247. Now it's always interesting as you look at these values. Uh, uh, one of the one of the things, the tendency in the least cost formulation world, at least, is to think of just tonnage cost, not necessarily most profit out of the plant. And this really becomes important to look at, and we'll run through some crude economics, at least, from this study, um, to show that really you need to be thinking about most profit coming out of the plant rather than what your tonnage cost is. If we here, we look at the main effect means here uh, for either the yellow bars being the total formula, total amino acid formulation versus the digestible uh, main effects here at 42 and 56 days, 
And again, the main effect means for either the 100% amino acid formulation, again, off of Avigen's recommendations, uh, this for a 708 bird versus that of a uh, 90% amino acid spec. If we're comparing the total versus digestible, essentially we see roughly a little bit over 0.1 pounds greater uh, bird, both at 42 and 56 days when formulated on a digestible basis. Very similar, a little bit over 0.1 pounds uh, when going to the higher amino acid uh, formulation spec here uh, between the 100% and 90% amino acid targets. Looking at uh, conversions, uh, the digestible amino acid formulations, both at 42 and 56 days of age, um, saved about three points of feed conversion. Looking at the, the higher amino acid spec, the 100% versus the 90%, roughly that translates into a savings of about four points of feed conversion there. Now the, the folks down in uh, at Avigen down in Alabama also took birds and processed them at both 42 and 56 days of age. And what they noted was that uh, there was considerable difference, at least, in total white meat yields as well as carcass yields uh, when looking at the digestible versus total uh, both at both ages. Similarly, big differences in uh, uh, both total white meat yields and carcass yields, again, but from 100 to 90 percent uh, amino acid targets. Essentially, the inverse of this graph is, is somewhat also true when you look at uh, the, um, the adipose fat um, in, the, in the viscera. Essentially, the, both the total formulation basis and as well as the 90% amino acid spec resulted in more uh, abdominal fat occurring in those birds as well. When we look at total economics per bird, um, Again, those, those per ton costs were higher for the, the digestible versus total as well as the 100 versus 90. That did translate then into more feed cost going into each bird uh, for the digestible and the 100%. The digestible versus total, we're talking about at 42 days, uh, 3.6 cents per bird more feed cost, 42 days, 5.6 cents more at 56 days. The, the amino acid spec, the 100 versus 90, at 42 days, the 100% uh, essentially cost 4.8 cents more, and at 56 days, 7.2 cents more. But again, it's critical not in evaluating only economics of feed itself and what's going into the bird itself, but rather um, how much return you're getting from that carcass over feed cost. And that's where the formulation uh, really comes in into play. If we look at this digestible versus total amino acid formulation, we did see that the digestible formulation did yield greater and returned over feed cost uh, 3.7 cents more at 42 days of age than formulating on a total basis. 56 days, that's 3.5 cents more return per bird uh, when formulating on a digestible basis versus that of a total. When we're looking at the, the higher uh, amino acid spec, we also had greater yields, lower feed conversions, which then translated into a, a more profit of 4.1 cents per bird at 42 days on that higher amino acid spec. Uh, not as great at 56 days, roughly about 1.6 cents. Again, greater for that 100% uh, um, that Avigen spec, at least, for their uh, amino acid values. So to kind of wrap up, uh, we do still have application limitations for the digestible amino acid concept. Uh, there are ways around that a number of different companies are uh, beginning to employ, at least in looking at uh, formulating. Uh, the limitations still include that we are not able to real-time formulate for that incoming batch of ingredients. We also still see some ingredient variability, particularly with those of the byproduct ingredients. Um, but in working with a single source supplier, I think there are ways to greatly reduce that variation. 
And the other thing within the literature, at least, we do see a lack of digestible amino acid requirement data uh, for different production phases. However, a number of different researchers who do conduct amino acid uh, uh, research throughout the country are at least uh, in their publications beginning to publish as well the digestible amino acid values for those uh, different phases. And realistically, at least when we did apply it in the case of the Avogen study, we re really did see a return on that investment uh, by increased profit per bird. Uh, we do see, uh, at least in, in conducting the LEO bioassays, do can see a consistency of values across laboratories, which gives us some confidence, at least in that uh, uh, methodology. Uh, and comparing methodologies, at least between the ileal and the cachectomized rooster, uh, we can say at least for, for corn that it's giving us uh, across several samples are giving us fairly similar values, which I think is telling, uh, particularly when we're using different endogenous correction methods. Comparison, at least to uh, just as kind of a, a side note, and at least from what we've seen on the DDGS values from our lab versus what uh, Phil Smith reported at Multistate for their values that they're seeing across DDG, DDGS sources. Fairly similar in the case of uh, standardized lysine values. So we, we, we are seeing some consistency across laboratories, but again, we need to confirm those across the same ingredient um, across uh, the ileal versus the cachectomized rooster, and we're, we're uh, in the process of getting that accomplished uh, with, uh, with Dr. Parsons at Illinois. Uh, a number of the results presented in this uh, paper today uh, couldn't have been done without a numerous folks across different institutions and companies. Uh, I think it's one of those good examples of folks uh, really working together um, because of the, the critical nature of uh, where feed ingredient prices are today, uh, trying to move this uh, formulation concept forward. Uh, thank some of those folks, including uh, Dr. Adiola and, and Dr. Adita Kun here at uh, Purdue University, Carl Parsons and Pam Utterback at the University of Illinois, uh, Mike Loburn, Ohio State University, uh, Dirk Holler and, and Rob Payne at uh, Degusa Corporation, Dave Burnham, Mark DeBeer, Kim Walters at Avigen, Joe Hess at uh, University of Auburn University, Paul Tillman at Ajinomoto, Terry York and uh, Shannon Peak Fien at Novus, John Lass at ADM, and funding as well from U.S. Poultry and Egg Association, Fats and Proteins Research Foundation, and the Midwest Poultry Consortium, uh, and countless others who have uh, put forward efforts into uh, uh, these thoughts, at least, in moving this uh, this concept forward. Last but not least, at least I'd like to put in a plug for poultry science. Uh, please join us this coming July, at least, in helping celebrate our centennial for poultry science. Um, it should be a very good meeting with a number of different historical contexts and landmark uh, uh, symposiums being celebrated. Um, there in, at Niagara Falls. Special thank you to Dr. Todd Applegate, poultry nutritionist at Purdue University, for his willingness to supply this information in this form for the poultry industry. I'm Ned Arthur, and we'll be talking soon.